Welcome to Module 9. In this video, we'll be reviewing Chapter 9 of the ODA Procedures Manual, which covers the ODA's internal audit and performance assessment program. Though many parts of the process are the same that we've used on previous self-audits, Revision F of the manual is an update using FAA Draft Order 8100.15, Revision C. The inclusion of this draft material was part of an FAA prototype effort that VTDRB participated in to validate the FAA's new requirements. We were only one of three ODAs that are allowed to use this material, and we've been given a deviation to continue to do so. Our objectives of this training include understanding the history of previous audits, looking at changes that were made and understanding why, as well as discussing the logistics of our internal audit using the FAA's new approach. This training is being provided to meet the requirement called out in the ODA Procedures Manual in paragraph 9.3.1. In addition to this module, you'll also need to watch module 10 on auditing techniques, as well as completing the introduction and modules 1 through 3, which provide an overview to the ODA, FAA policy and guidance, and the Procedures Manual. Auditors who will be conducting performance assessments within a specific technical discipline will also need to have completed the module associated with those unit members. In addition to this video training, the audit team will hold a preparation meeting within two weeks of the audit so that logistics can be discussed and questions answered. This should give you plenty of time to do any review that's helpful for you to prepare to begin the audit on the starting day. The requirements to conduct annual internal audits are regulatory in nature being established in 14 CFR 183.53 C5, which requires a process and a procedure for periodic audit by the ODA holder of the ODA unit and its procedures. The draft order 8100.15 goes further in explaining self-audit requirements in paragraph 3-5L. In summary, the expectation is that there are program audits of the ODA holder's compliance to approve procedures and an evaluation of ODA unit members' performance every calendar year. That when auditing compliance to the procedures manual processes, the system compliance audit criteria in Section 2 of Appendix C of the order is used. That when we're evaluating unit member performance, the authorized function performance assessment criteria of Section 3 in Appendix C of the order is used, and that a qualified audit staff is used to conduct the required evaluations. It's also expected that an audit plan is developed and includes all of the required evaluation items, the assigned audit staff, and an audit schedule, and it must be approved by the administrator. There needs to be an evaluation, and the results must be well documented and identify any non-compliances, unsatisfactory performance issues, as well as the opportunities for improvement. And finally, there needs to be a final audit report that is provided to the FAA. Since becoming an ODA in January 2011, we've conducted six audits and the FAA has completed three DOIP inspections. And you can see that the trending in findings for each review is going down. While the number of projects, the orange line, has increased significantly. So our rate of finding has decreased significantly over time we seem to be growing into a healthier organization. Historically, self-audits have been structured to follow the guidance provided in the order for FAA auditors when they perform a Designated Organization Inspection Program, or a DOIP review. This was spelled out in Chapter 6 of earlier versions of the order with all the criteria laid out in Appendix C. And there were nine different areas for an ODA to look at, which included organization and responsibility, project management, design data approval, the conformity inspection process, um, looking at those records as well, some testing, airworthiness certification, flight testing of course, continued airworthiness, production approvals, operations certifications. Um, we don't actually do that certifi operation certification, it's outside of what is applicable to us. As you look at all of these bullet items, you'll recognize that everything is very project centric. In short, a team of people would show up with a background in certification procedures, specific technical expertise, and experience auditing to determine what to look at from this project-centric perspective and determine if the ODA was complying with its procedures. The review focused on a lot of reviewing of project documentation to try and find errors. 
which isn't necessarily a great way to see how well a process is working. This audit approach has had some significant issues because it is so heavily focused on reviewing project documentation, which is really a redundant effort as the same paperwork is reviewed by the ODA, the FAA, and then again during an annual unit member performance review, the FAA recognized that the results weren't providing any insight into where problems may exist within the ODA. They weren't actually measuring anything, as would be expected when conducting a process audit, so they couldn't use the data to arrive at any meaningful conclusions about the ODA program help. Because of the issues with ODA audits, Congress passed the Certification Rulemaking Reform Act in February of 2012, or otherwise known as PL 112-95, and this new public law asked that the FAA assess how they were conducting oversight and look for ways where they could improve efficiency. More specifically, they were asked to find methods to enhance how designees, especially ODAs, are used in the certification process. An internal team review provided recommendations to shift from conducting detailed project reviews to taking a systems approach which relies on verifying process compliance within an organization. In accomplishing this shift, the FAA is expected to analyze real performance and use a risk approach to determine when they need to conduct oversight, meaning that instead of being required to go to a facility every two years and review project packages, they can use different time frames or look at areas other than the project folder for errors. While the FAA was working to develop their new guidance, VTDRB elected to make some changes early in the audit program. Instead of waiting for the FAA changes, we conducted two annual audits using our different approach using a systems idea so that we could knowledgeably incorporate what the FAA developed when it came time. When we were ready for the prototype, we knew that we were quite capable because we had gone beyond the given criteria of the old audit areas and started gathering feedback on what works and what didn't work and really being able to fine tune our process while still meeting the FAA requirements and we created a hybrid audit using FAA criteria and a process review of the ODA as a system. So where do you start with a systems approach? By defining an organization as a system. Now that sounds easy enough but it's really kind of a different way to look at the ODA. The FAA provided a basic systems model at an ODA seminar. That's the starting point that we used. A system has boundaries, inputs. Those inputs initiate an action, processes that control that action from beginning to end, and then an output or a result of that action. And then, of course, there's always that loop so that you have continual improvement of your performance because the organization should monitor itself so that corrections can be made proactively. The FAA is looking for self-healing organizations or an ODA that can self-correct without the FAA being involved to make it happen. So corrective actions are really important. This is what they consider a high-functioning ODA. So using the FAA system model, we bucketed our processes and expectations to define individual areas to be audited. You can see from the model, a boundary is included to account for the management support and the environment that the ODA works in. Processes are identified as well as results, which reflect on the performance we need to be doing well at to be a robust ODA. And there's also different tools that we use to monitor and improve in a continuous fashion. So these are the six areas that we use to define the scope of the self-audit that we've been using for the past few years. And these things include the overall system, input integration, systems controls for unit member selection and management, facilities and training, and systems controls for project management and the certification process. We also have output quality that we look at and then our continuous improvement piece of it. There are definitely still areas for improvement. For example, I wouldn't consider a project or a unit member application as a great definition of an input though that's really how it's kind of currently listed. The handoff between the engineering department to the certification group to the ODA, on the other hand, has a lot of impact in our process inputs. That's kind of outside of our current ODA boundary, but that might be a real place that we need to start exploring better or its impact on the system as a whole sometime in the future. Now that we've been working with the draft order from the FAA, we find they've changed the areas for their review to include the following system elements the procedures manual, records, unit members, training, 
internal audits, corrective actions, self-monitoring, and authorized functions. Now, each of these systems elements have system compliance evaluation items to review during the internal audit or performance evaluation, and they're twined with what it is that we have put together. But we updated our systems model of the ODA to show these system elements by bolding them within the graphic, which is figure one in the ODA procedures manual. So you can see that these newly defined systems are really some of the areas that we were looking at in our initial de definition. We just tried to merge our terms a little bit better. So how do we take our new system model and connect an audit then? What we did right from the beginning is we created a playbook, each of the six audit areas in our process compliance audit. An auditor is responsible for one or more playbooks and then one for the unit member performance assessment or the technical review that we called it. Each of the FAA system elements are embedded inside of one of these playbooks along with additional areas for review that the ODA is interested in looking at. This approach differs from the old way of auditing because in the past compliance of a process was never actually confirmed. Instead, it was kind of the reverse approach. If there's no finding in an area that was reviewed, it was really just assumed to be a compliant. Using the playbooks, what we're doing is auditors are verifying compliance by documenting what they see that shows that the expectations have been met. In previous order versions, the criteria offered was worded as questions, not requirements. So it was more like helpful hints of things an auditor could look at. This draft material, it's focused solely on the order requirements as we're expected to provide feedback to the FAA all the time on how things are working for us. It's always good to take notes of things that you think can be improved because I'd really like your opinions as you go through the whole audit process. Additionally, in the playbook, we've summarized the items that are being reviewed for compliance as statements of what should be demonstrated for good performance. We're trying to keep the focus on being very result-oriented. For example, an item an auditor will be asked to confirm is something like, the ODA ensures it continually operates within its authorized functions and limitations. The auditor is asked to find evidence that allows them to confirm that the answer is yes, that the ODA does ensure it continually operates within its authorized functions and limitations. Between these six playbooks, there's only 20 items being confirmed in the whole audit like projects are managed effectively or we're meeting organization and management responsibilities. So this should really be a piece of cake, right? Maybe it's not quite so simple, but let's take a little bit closer look at the details of our requirements and how they're defined in the playbooks. So to help understand where the requirements come from, an index has been placed in Appendix H of the Procedures Manual so that you've got a cross-reference between the FAA system elements, compliance evaluation item that the FAA requires to be audited, where that requirement is defined in the order and what playbook it is being reviewed in. So you should be able to have this map of where everything is put together at. So as we work through playbooks and this index, let me know if anything doesn't quite jive right. Let's move and change sometimes and so you might get something that's not quite right. It's lining up everything is a little bit more complex than you'd expect. I think we're in a pretty good place, but it takes a number of reviews to keep everything straight. Let me know if you see something that's kind of wonky. You look at a playbook, which can be found in the ODA SharePoint under the topic of self-audit. The questions have multiple review areas to develop an answer. Very reviewed points you to the regulatory requirement where you can find more information in an FAA order and where it's called out in the ODA procedures manual. You can see these Questions are really those big picture 20 items, like number one, projects are managed effectively. That's our big picture question. Then they're broken down into different pieces in the boxes. And what you'll see behind where it says show audit criteria, you open that up. That's where you find a lot of the meat, of what it is that you should be looking at, the FAA requirements are, and the additional stuff that we have you looking at. We'll cover the playbooks as we go, but recognizing what the requirements are is extremely important. So I want to explain what it looks like when this doesn't happen. Let's look at an example of one of our big picture questions asking, unit member selection processes achieve needed technical expertise. The intent is to verify we're appointing the right people with, with the right qualifications. There are three areas we look at to check this out. One of them being 
selected unit members meet all defined criteria for their technical authorized functions. The criteria are defined in the procedures manual, which is based on order 8100.8. However, if you look at this playbook write-up from the auditor that reviewed this area in the past, you'll see that the person spoke with the lead administrator, two unit members, and Juan Rivera, who happens to be the company's quality inspector and actually has no association with the ODA whatsoever. So it makes you wonder why that person was selected to discuss unit member appointments, especially when Juan has no connection to the process at all. Then, as you look at what was observed, the auditor explains that all unit members have access to the company website for the procedures manual and FAA policy and procedures. They are annually reviewed and verified to possess integrity, sound judgment, and a cooperative attitude, which is good to know. But having access to a website and being reviewed annually has nothing to do with being selected as a unit member from the very beginning point. So from what the auditor observed, there's really no way to make a connection with the starting point of UM management, which is when the person is vetted before being added to the ODA list, versus the things that they pointed out, the website and the annual reviews. So here's an example that makes you go, hmm. Now coming back to the playbooks, you're free to ask any questions you may have or follow any audit process that works for you. However, the FAA items must be checked. So you can see that we've tried to highlight those with the SE 8.E.3 kind of designation. Those are the FAA required ones. We try to make it very clear which ones are FAA requirements versus those that the ODA is interested in. So why is there a difference? The FAA is looking to make sure we comply with their requirements. I'd like to know if we go beyond that and do it well. I really want to know if there's something that we need to improve upon. Now, I don't want to lose the forest and all the trees, so I'm looking feedback on the whole system, not just the things that we're required to meet as a baseline performance standard. That's where the difference is. Because the FAA is concerned that we're clear about which items in the audit meet their requirements and which ones are our additional items, I've tried to mark their audit criteria or evaluation with bold FAA required as well as a system element index number in parentheses. Again, these numbers are important if there's a finding, and I'll try to explain that later. For those associated with ODA questions that are listed as criteria to consider, these criteria are suggestions or ideas that might help you to confirm compliance. If there's additional thoughts that you have to help validate the process, use them. And let me know if you think they should be added to the playbook for future use as well. There are sections to be filled in the document about who you discussed an item with, notes from your discussions or observations that you made, where somebody could find specific evidence that was used to validate compliance. Don't be brief. Last year I had an auditor who did the bare bones minimum. He talked to one person about one project and filled out his playbook in a way that demonstrate he didn't look at very much. And the reason to fill in this playbook is to document that we looked at a very solid sample to make that we're compliant. Remember, we're looking at a system which should be able to work over a lot of different instances. Looking at one item is just one data point, which really doesn't tell us very much. So we use a sample list that's provided in the audit plan to help us know where to begin. Each auditor doesn't need to look at every single item in the plan, but the entire team needs to have gone through the entire sample. The team lead is going to track against the audit plan so that we make sure we're covering everything by the end of the week together. As an auditor, you're looking for that sweet spot where you can say, based on the evidence of the things I've seen, things are really working well or not. As mentioned, I have an example where the auditor discussed a process with one person and called it good. Let's take a look at it uh, just a little bit more closely and see why this isn't effective. In this case, the auditor was expected to determine if the ODA, as an organization, uses the latest FAA policy and guidance when accomplishing its authorized functions. From the playbook write-up, you can see that the auditor spoke with one inspection unit member and learned that he knew where the FAA Resource and Guidance Library, or RGL, is located and that that person always refers to the website, which is all goodness. But in this case, the ODA 
as an organization is expected to use a lot more policy and guidance than just what's been published in the inspection realm. So when thinking of the use of policy and guidance as a process, an auditor should be curious about how the ODA manages policy and guidance updates. There may be steps that are taken to communicate updates across the unit. There may be tools that are used to ensure that each project is evaluated against the latest policy and guidance to determine what's needed for the work to be accomplished. Each unit member is also responsible for staying up to date in their technical area. So knowing how they make decisions regarding the latest policy and guidance may be helpful to understand. Those are the types of questions that should come to mind when we're looking at the criteria to be considered in the playbook, knowing where the RGL website is located in the criteria listed. So also not necessarily a very good data point to show that the ODA as an organization complies with this item. Let's look a little bit further into past auditor performance. As an auditor, you are not expected to be an expert on the processes you are auditing. The folks using the processes are but you should be able to understand the questions that the playbook is asking. This will be similar to an earlier example, but it's used here to stress the point that as an auditor, you should be clear on what part of the process it is that you're looking at. In this example, the area is unit member records validate appointment decisions and continued authorization. You can see from the playbook write-up that they spoke with me, and I showed them our database for tracking unit member activity. The person was able to see when a unit member was noted as active or inactive, and the auditor looked at some activity reports. However, the criteria is regarding the appointment process and the oversight actions that are taken. The records associated with these elements of unit member management are very different than activity reports. So what do you do in cases where you don't understand the criteria or the question that you're expected to audit? First, look at the information in the order the procedures manuals that are referred to at the top of the box. If that doesn't help you, ask your team lead. They should be able to help you figure out the crux of what's to be audited. If it's still unclear after your review of the reference information and your discussion with the team lead, talk to the lead ODA administrator and ask what the ODA is really interested in learning. Let's look at some finding examples to make sure the information entered for required and encountered conditions are clear. The first is from an FAA finding where they saw that the ODA manual said that a compliance report will be prepared prior to STC issuance. For the required condition, the auditor cut and paste the exact wording and provided the location that the information was found so that anyone going over the finding would see the same thing that they saw. They then explained what they observed in the encountered conditions section. In this case, he or she didn't find a compliance report in the project files that they looked at. In this particular case, the auditor also noted that the certification basis had conflicts, which is actually outside of the required condition identified. I think the person was trying to save us from having two separate findings, but you can see that for clarity purposes, it should be easy to see what the requirement is and how the encountered condition doesn't meet that requirement. In comparison, let's take a look to, at one of our previous audit findings. Unsurprisingly, we're mimicking the FAA approach with regard to required and encountered conditions. In this case, the auditor provided an excerpt from the ODA manual that stated we must submit completed airworthiness packages to the MITO within 14 days of completion. This auditor found that we had cases where we'd missed a 14-day due date and pointed out that the wording in the manual was confusing because it wasn't clear if completion indicated the package or the review. In this case, the finding was clear as well as offered ways to make an improvement. If compliance isn't shown and you discover a discrepancy, it must be written up as a non-compliance. ODA Form 1.004 is used to document these findings, and it's based on the form offered in the ODA order, and it's been tweaked a little bit for our use. When documenting a finding, include the playbook that you're using, the related system element, again, those numbers from the FAA list, their system element numbers, and the specific element item number, and that's where the index is going to come in handy for you. There may be more than one set of criteria to choose from. 
select the one that is the most relevant to what you found, where the FAA required items take precedence over ODA items. For the discrepancy number, we'll use the format of calendar year, auditor initials, and a sequential number. For example, 2017-MS-001, where the sequence is based on the team findings, not an individual. So if there's 10 items, we should have 1 through 10 listed on the sequential number part, not MS1, MS2, or AB1. Just make sure it's sequential. You're going to check the safety-related box if there are systems concerns in what you uncovered, and check whether you feel the item is systemic or isolated. So if you found more than one instance of the issue, then it's systemic. If you only found one time where it happened, it's isolated. The next is the box that is called required condition. Now what we do is we document the required condition by providing a very specific reference and excerpt of what the requirement is. This will come from the procedures manual, the FAA order, or a policy document. If there's no requirement, there is no finding. Now, there are some items in the playbooks that do not have requirements defined, but instead are areas that we consider important to look at as we learn more about our expanded audit and looking at the things that aren't necessarily just compliance driven. If there's something that you come across that does not have a requirement, include it in the section for opportunities for improvement instead of as a finding. In the encountered condition section, describe what you saw and why there's an issue. Include evidence or copies of what it is that you saw in the attachment section. The intent is that we make it very simple for someone else to be able to trace your steps and see what you saw so that they can reach the same conclusion of a non-compliance. Let's look at some finding examples to make sure the information entered for required and encountered conditions are clear. The first is from an FAA finding where they saw that the ODA manual said that a compliance report will be prepared prior to STC issuance. For the required condition, the auditor cut and pasted the exact wording and provided the location that the information was found so that anyone going over the finding would see the same thing that they saw. They then explained what they observed in the encountered condition section. In this case, he or she didn't find a compliance report in the project files that they looked at. In this particular case, the auditor also noted that the certification basis had conflicts, which is actually outside of the required condition identified. I think the person was trying to save us from having two separate findings, but you can see that for clarity purposes, it should be easy to see what the requirement is and how the encountered condition doesn't meet that requirement. In comparison, let's take a look to, at one of our previous audit findings. Unsurprisingly, we're mimicking the FAA approach with regard to required and encountered conditions. In this case, the auditor provided an excerpt from the ODA manual that stated, we must submit completed airworthiness packages to the MITO within 14 days of completion. This auditor found that we had cases where we'd missed a 14-day due date and pointed out that the wording in the manual was confusing because it wasn't clear if completion indicated the package or the review. In this case, the finding was clear as well as offered ways to make an improvement. The end of each playbook has a conclusion section, and these are items that are to be confirmed during the audit. So we're breaking it down to those big items and showing where we're good or not. What you can see is that you'll check those items that were shown as compliant and list those findings where there were a non-compliant. And note any areas where improvement should be considered but didn't really result in a finding. You'll sign the playbook at the end of the audit. Easy peasy, right? You might be interested in the logistics of the audit though. It's broken into two sections again, the process compliance review and the technical performance assessment. The performance assessments are conducted by a technical auditor over the span of a month based on the discipline. Structures usually comes in September, mechanical systems and power plant in October, electrical systems in November, flight test in December, manufacturing and ICAs in January. At the beginning of each month, I generate a work accomplished report for each unit member and I provide it to the auditor. The auditor is then able to sample the work and complete a playbook as described earlier for each person within a discipline. An auditor cannot audit his own work. So when finished, all completed playbooks and finding write-ups are sent back to me. 
For the on-site process compliance audit, we're a bit more formal in our approach as we try to keep everyone involved aware of what's going on. Transparency is key to doing a good audit. On the day the audit begins, there's an opening inspection briefing to the ODA administrators, senior management of the ODA holder, certification engineers, and unit members that might be selected to attend. The lead auditor explains the audit purpose, plan, and what to expect. In the past, after the briefing, the ODA provides the files requested by the auditors, and they usually sit in a conference room or other area and review the data in the folders for compliance. On occasion, you may ask someone a question, but the primary focus has been reviewing documentation, looking for errors on a form, checking to see if the proper FAA guidance has been followed, or if there's any holes in how a decision is made. Like I've said quite a bit, we'd like to make sure that's changed. Auditors are not the experts of an ODA project. The people who work them are, and they have the answers to the questions. So talk to people. Techniques for auditing will be shared in the next module to help make sure that this is very clear. At the end of each inspection day, the team gets back together to regroup and see how things are going, and meets with the ODA representatives to provide a progress report, discuss any problems with logistics that need to be addressed to smooth the audit out, or to provide requests at what will be needed the following day so that nobody's waiting for any information. By the last day, all playbooks will be finalized and all findings will be compiled to summarize what occurred during the internal audit. The team will conduct an outbriefing with the ODA holder management and ODA representatives to explain the conclusions reached and explain next steps. After that, we all go home. The audit team lead will take the completed findings and compile them into an audit report that summarizes what was accomplished and the discrepancies that were found. This must be drafted, reviewed, and released so that it can be provided to the OMT within 10 days of audit completion, so it's very quick. It will be sent to the entire audit team to make sure that you, as auditors, concur with the end results that are documented. Because of that short time frame, all the findings and playbooks really have to be completed by the last day of the audit. There can't be any IOUs because that's gonna hold up that final report. Then, within the next 30 days, each item is reviewed by the lead ODA administrator. A causal analysis is generated for each issue, and remedial and preventative corrective action plans are developed. These are collected into the final audit report, which is also shared with the OMT. One of the items that's included in this final audit report is the Internal Audit Summary Report System Compliance Form. That's a requirement from the order. This is completed by marking areas that are C for compliant, NC for non-compliant or OFI for opportunities for improvement. This encapsulates all of the pieces that we've been walking through and will visually sum up all the work completed in the playbooks. So it should be easy to connect the dots between Appendix C of the order, the criteria in the playbooks, and when a finding in those areas results in a checkbox as unsatisfactory or an area is actually compliant. All of the feedback is valuable as it helps the ODA become a better organization. Some of the things developed in response to past audits include creation of a compliance database for project tracking, um, developing the conformity database to manage all inspection items, implementation of DocuSign for our electronic signatures, and a very focused review process for all of our project folders and putting a records ODA administrator in place so that we do that very well. Getting our EWIS report standardized, coming up with some standardization for system safety analysis across projects, and even putting in very tight conformity review processes for conformity packages. Because we value the improvement opportunities that self-audits provide, we really appreciate your efforts in making the ODA better. As you work through the playbooks, all of our newly defined systems approaches, and all the processes that the ODA works to, your feedback is most welcome. Please let me know if there's any way we can make things work better. Also, when you notify me that you've completed this module, please make sure and include the secret code. Auditing is powerful.